Hey folks, so welcome back to another lesson and this is part two of three of our interference lesson and today we're going to describe, excuse me, and calculate the path difference and then we're going to use this path difference to calculate um, interference. So uh, a lot of kind of calculations today for this lesson. So just to remind you a little bit about interference, remember we're talking about a single wave which is split into two uh, wave fronts which can then interfere and then you get this lovely interference pattern where you get a bright, dark, bright, dark fringes. And remember that this was called Young's double slit experiment and we use a double slit to create this interference pattern. Okay, so before we get into this um, path difference, let's just look at a wee reminder for you that remember waves can interact via interference. In phase waves will interfere constructively. Waves are in phase if the crest meets a crest or a trough meets a trough. So they are either one wavelength at a step or multiples of one wavelength. So it could be one, it could be zero in fact. It could be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight wavelengths out. As long as they are a whole wavelength out, you will still get waves that are in phase. So here's a new definition that I want you to write down. Path difference is literally the difference in meters between the lengths of two paths. So we're very unimaginative. We name things exactly to mean what they are. So for waves to be in phase, they must have a path difference that is a whole number of wavelengths. Because remember, if they're one wavelength out or multiples of that, they will always be in phase. So one way to think about it is you can think about train carriages. So each of these is a train carriage. Or if you like, this could be your wave where this is the crest and this is a trough. And the train carriages can be one out, but then you can see these will match up exactly. So that means there's a path difference of one carriage or one wavelength in order for these to be in phase. If you're not sure about that, look for the, the slide again or look at the worked example and then that hopefully will make it a bit clearer to you. If you can nail this understanding of what a path difference is and what path difference you need to get a constructive interference, this is actually fairly straightforward. Now we can extend this idea here to having another card here. Again, you can see there's a path difference of one there. Okay, so let's look at how we use this idea of path difference to explain interference. So we've got a Young's double slit experiment here where we have our double slit and this causes our wave to separate into two sources, source one and source two. We have the screen where the waves will uh, meet together and we see the interference pattern. To make it simpler for us, we're only going to look at one interference pattern first of all. And this pattern is the one at point P, which is exactly in the middle between the double slit. So you can see from my diagram here that these two uh, lines here represent the wavelength of light and that they really are about the same length. Because they're going to exactly the middle of the screen, they must take the same path length, if you like. So what is the path difference? Well, to write it more formally, we write the following. For constructive interference, the path difference, which is called S2P minus S1P. So usually, instead of writing S1P, uh, S2P minus one S1P, we can sometimes just write PD. And PD just stands for path difference. Now, it looks complicated, but S2P simply means S2 going to P. And S1P simply means S1 going to P. Now, where does this M lambda come from? Well, first of all, we know that for constructive interference, the waves have to be either zero wavelengths out or multiples of one wavelength apart. So this is where this one wavelength comes apart. M rep represents how many wavelengths apart they are. So first of all, we've got a technical word for that. M is called the order of the maxima. And the central maxima is always taken as zero. So um, let's just sip on a wee bit. So here, m equal to zero 
means this red one here is a central maxima because it's right in the middle. And it's usually the brightest maxima because if you think about it in the equation, if m is equal to zero, this means this right hand side becomes zero, which means the waves have zero path difference. So that means every part of part of wave one can interfere with every part of wave two. So you get the maximum interference. If we move one along to the next order of maxa, m equal to one, we now see that the equation becomes the path difference is equal to one times the wavelength. So that tells us one wave will have all the wavelengths. The second wave that interferes with it will be missing one of the wavelengths in order for it to be in phase. So that means we're not inter interfering the full wavelengths of both waves, we're interfering the full wavelength of one wave and the, the wavelength of the other wave is missing one. And so that's why you're getting a slightly darker fringe. It's because we're not interfering the same amount of wavelengths as we are in the central maxima. We can then extend this um, explanation to M2, M3, M4, etc. So if we look at our diagram here, this is the double slit with the waves spreading out and the central maxima will always be the brightest. Then we get the first order maxima, which is the next brightest, because remember, we're now missing one wavelength. The second order maxima, we're now missing two wavelengths. It's a symmetrical diagram because the same thing could happen underneath M0. So this is also called the first order maxima and the second order maxima. And you need to know the names of these maximas uh, from the diagram. Okay, so let's look at a worked example and hopefully this will explain some of this idea to you. So given the above, if F1P is 160 millimeters and S2P is 200 millimeters for a third order maxima, calculate the path difference between S1P and S2P and the wavelength of the source of light. As always, if you feel confident, try it yourself. If not, we'll take you through it. So here's our question here. And remember, we're using this um, equation, if you like. We're told what S1P and S2P are. So if we're doing a KFC, we know what these two are. Now, a wee point, these really should be in meters, but sometimes it's easier just to do them in this unit and then convert them at the end. It's up to you. So to get part one, the path difference, remember, this S2P minus S1P is sometimes called the path difference. We just do a subtraction and we get the answer is 40 millimeters, which is 0 0.04 meters. So remember, we always want it in meters because wavelength is in meters. Hopefully you can see it's actually really simple. All we're doing is just subtracting one path from the other path. To get the wavelength, we now use our answer from part one because we now have the path difference, which is this bit. We know it's a third order maxima, so we know what M is, and then that allows us to work out the wavelength. So we sub it in, rearrange it, and we should get 0 0.0133, which rounds to 0 0.013 meters. And that's how you do constructive interference using path difference. Make sure you understand this example because that's what you have to do for these questions. Now, let's move on and look at destructive interference. So to remind you, for destructive interference, we have out of phase waves will interfere destructively. Waves are out of phase if the crest meets a trough or if they're half a wavelength out of step. So that could be a half, that could be one and a half, because remember one and a half is still half a wavelength out or two and a half, three and a half, and I think you can kind of see the pattern developing there. So how do we use path difference to calculate out of phase uh, waves? So first of all, remember path difference is the difference in meters between the lengths of two paths. So for waves out of phase, if you could write this down, they must have path difference that is half a wavelength out. So that could be half, one and a half, two and a half, etc. So again, if we use our carriage, the train carriage idea, 
So each of these represents the carriage. And then if they're half a wavelength out, then you can imagine the carriage lining up like this so they don't exactly match up. And you can see that gives you the destructive interference. In terms of a young double slit experiment, let's look at how that works. So again, we have a double slit here, which gives us our sources, uh, source one and source two. We have our screen and we now have a point P, which is a little bit off center. And it's got to be that because remember, in the previous example for constructive interference, the central bit right in the middle was the, the zero order maxima, which was also the brightest fringe. And remember, the destructive interference is straight next to the constructive interference. So that's why P is a little bit offset. Now, straight away from this diagram, you can hopefully see that the path S1 to P is different from the path S2 to P. So, just like before, destructive interference is given by the path difference, because remember, S2P minus S1P is just a fancy way of saying the path difference is equal to m plus a half times lambda. Just like before, but because we're looking at destructive interference, we don't want a whole wavelength out, we want half a wavelength out. And again, m is equal to zero, one, two, et cetera. Please copy down this equation because you're going to be using this in the next example. So as before, m in this case is now called the order of minima. And notice there is no central minima because there's a central maxima, there isn't space for the central minima. So let's look at it in terms of the big picture. So notice this is our central maxima, which is the brightest fringe. And on either side, we have our first order minima and our second order minima. And notice because there's no m equal to zero uh, for zero order minima, that means for minima, m is always one less than the order. So for example, our um, m equal to zero is actually our first order minima. Our m equal to two is actually our first order minima. Ignore these m here because these are actually for the bright fringes. So in this case here, this is actually m equal to zero because it's always got to be one less than the order. And this is actually m equal to one. And we get the same thing happening down below here as well. So again, let's look at a worked example to hopefully develop your understanding. So given the above, if F1P is 80 millimeters and S2P is 170 millimeters for a fourth order minima, calculate the path difference and the wavelength of the source of light. So try this yourself if you feel confident. If not, I'll take you through it in the next slide. Now, just like before, we're going to use the equation for destructive interference. Remember, this is the equation here. And to calculate the path difference, hopefully you can see it's very simple. It's just S2P minus S1P, which is 170 minus 80, and that gives us 90 millimeters. And remember, we want our units in meters, so that's our final answer. So all we're doing is we're subtracting uh, this length here. 80 millimeters from the 170 millimeters. To get the wavelength, we use our answer from above, which is really the path difference, and that's equal to m plus a half lambda. Now here's the trick. Remember, the order of the minima is always one less than the actual value of m. So if it's a fourth order minima, m is actually three. If you're not sure, Look at that slide there where I told you what m equal to zero, m equal to one was. And once you figure that out, you realize we put three in here. So it's three and a half wavelengths out. We just uh, calculate it and we get the wavelength is 0 0.026 meters. Now, make sure you know how to do this one. The main trick here is remembering that the value of m is always one less than the order of minima. If you can figure that out, this is actually fairly, excuse me, straightforward. So in summary, constructive interference is given by this. 
and destructive interference is given by this. These equations are both in your data sheet, so make sure you know where they, where they are and you're familiar with them. We're now going to look at some worked examples to help you with the calculations. So here's a, a slightly trickier one. Have a wee read of it, and then we're going to go through the answer together. So how do we get the solution? So first of all, notice you've got a triangle here. And that actually has the length 12 metres and 3 metres. It's 12 metres because the distance from the screen is 12 metres. It's 3 metres, and this is where it's tricky, because remember, the whole thing is actually 4, but this actually has a distance of 1 metre in between the two. So in order to get the length here, you've got to do 4 minus 1, which gives you 3. So the length AQ, we can just calculate it by using Pythagoras' theorem. Now, if we look at BQ, we can draw a similar triangle. But notice again that these don't match up with the diagram. So let's draw it out a little bit better. And we get 12 and 5. It's 12 because this length here is still 12. It's 5 because remember, the 4 only goes to the midpoint between the two speakers. So you have to add on that extra one meter there. And once you've got that, you can then work out that distance. And then you can calculate the path difference, work out the order of maxima, and work out the wavelength. So that's how they can make these questions tricky, is to get you to do a bit of trigonometry along with the actual equation.